So good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you all for uh, coming this afternoon. It is my uh, great pleasure to introduce today's uh, colloquium speaker, Volker Koch from uh, Lawrence Berkeley uh, National Lab. Uh, Volker did his PhD in uh, 1990 in G at Gießen University in Germany, working on uh, transport descriptions of hydronic systems, especially in low energy heavy ion collisions. He uh, then moved on to do a postdoc at uh, Stony Brook University, working with, uh, in particular, Jerry Brown, of course, also working on it by himself uh, for, for a few years. He became a research assistant professor there, and um, in fact, as a research assistant professor, won the faculty teaching award, which is quite remarkable. In 1995, he then um, got an offer from Berkeley Lab, uh, which he accepted to become a divisional fellow in 1995. And then in 1999, he became the uh, uh, full uh, staff senior scientist at Berkeley Lab. He furthermore saw, served as a um, deputy head of the low energy uh, division of Berkeley Lab from 2004 to 2007, very important. Um, and from 2007 on, he's the director of the nuclear theory program uh, at the Berkeley Nuclear Theory Group. So Volker has... Uh, uh, of course, won uh, several prizes, including, uh, of course, APS Fellow uh, 2010, um, and he has a very broad uh, portfolio in strong interaction physics, uh, not only transport theory, which uh, I think is still one of his uh, uh, interests today, uh, but he studied things like uh, charge, con uh, charge fluctuations, which are a very important tool to find uh, phase transitions in heavy ion collisions. He studied dilepton production, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, today, he'll give us a broad overview um, of uh, what we have learned from uh, heavy ion collisions about hot and dense matter, in particular also about the sort of notorious 8 over S ratio, which he uh, expressed some, uh, his, some of his own views on it. So we, we, are, we are curious uh, to hear about that. Um, before I give you a microphone, let me uh, make sure that we keep this visit here in a good memory. Um, with a laser point engraved with your name, Ooh. and you can uh, use it. Uh, it's wow. ready to use. So Great. Let's uh, light on. So let me see if I can handle it. Yes, yes. That's not on, huh? Hello, hello. That does it work? Well, usually I don't need one. So thank you very much for this kind introduction, and... Thank you for having me here. The last time with Cheming we just worked it out was 12 years ago when I had my first near-death experience flying into College Station from uh, Dallas, just the last flight before they shut down the airport as due to a thunderstorm. And so this time it was a little bit smoother, although I got put through the meat grinder by my colleagues here, so now this thing stops. Okay, so what I want to talk about, as Ralph said, is the properties of strongly interacting matter as we think we extracted them from many years of heavy ion collisions. And of course, the question of how matter in extreme conditions behaves has been thought about for a long time. Here on the, uh, on the web, you can find this nice sketch by Enrico Fermi, dating back from 1953, where he has all kinds of things, degenerate electron gases. So here is the density logarithmically, here is the temperature, and you will see plots like that during my talk. And what I point out, what we study, somehow this is, okay, what we study at uh, these heavy ion collisions are up here in the extreme of terra Kelvin, and what our friends in the atomic physics labs nowadays, let me just turn on my timer here, uh, what in the atomic physics labs now with uh, 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 laser cooling and so on, are st studying systems down here in the just opposite corner, especially this cold Fermi gas, and you will see, and I will show you that, at least phenomenologically we see quite different things, and the, what the question is, are they actually related or is it just a coincidence? And of course, after many, many years of research, this diagram has progressed. And in particular, you get all kind of different uh, uh, plots and for many, many years. And at the end of the day, we added some color to it. 
but the things look pretty much the same, right? So we have temperature, we have density, sometimes you have uh, maybe a chemical potential, you have a, 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 a deconfined phase, the Big Bang comes down here, early universe where you have no net baryon density but high temperature, and the advantage of heavy ion collisions, as I will discuss towards the end of my talk, is by tuning the beam energy, you can actually move in the region of finite density where possibly interesting phenomena are to be uh, explored. But since we are talking about strong interactions, I thought I flash the, the Lagrangian of the theory of strong interaction as it is in the standard model, and it looks pretty simple, just like electrodynamics and all the interesting choose is in this little term because now we are having an SU3 non-abelian gauge theory called quantum chromodynamics and all of a sudden the vector bosons exchange and interaction can interact with themselves, right? So this makes all the interest and all the, all the difficulties in calculating this for the theorists. Of course, as you might remember, QCD already got a Nobel Prize for asymptotic freedom, which is shown here. Now, this is the, the, the coupling as a function of the momentum transfer. So this is short distance, this is long distance, and the coupling goes down. And this is borne out beautifully in this HERA data on the evolution of the uh, wave functions of the nucleons. And you may ask yourself, why are we still studying QCD if there's already a Nobel Prize? Well, the reason why this is so successful is that they studied actually the strong interaction when it's weak. So that's everybody can do this, right? Well, it's still difficult enough. So in the high, high energy limit, the strong interaction is weak, and therefore you can do perturbation theory, and life becomes manageable. But what about down here? Small momentum transfer. That's our life, right? So that's actually... Not yet solved, really. And so what I, that's what I call the long distance QCD. And there we have things like, I give you here a plot from, this is from lattice QCD, the heavy quark potential. So we all think there is a confinement. Nobody yet has seen a free quark. Even in a free country like the US, there is no free quarks. In addition, we have dynamical mass generation. So here is the fraction of mass in red which comes from QCD, and in blue, and this note is a logarithmic scale, which comes from the Higgs. So roughly about 50 MeV from a 1 GV mass of the proton comes from the Higgs sector, and 950 MeV comes from QCD. So if your high energy friends tell you they found where the mass comes from, well, it's a 5% effect and not even the Weight Watchers would give you a, a, a grant to discuss a 5% lowering of the mass, right? So even if you have no Higgs, your QCD, your, your proton would be still 900 MeV heavy, right? So as for the low mass hadrons, these are the quarks, for the low mass hadrons, actually the mass generation comes from QCD. In addition, it's very interesting to see, so far we actually know the proton has been half, it has a mass, but the, what is the wave function, how, how is this put together, is actually not yet understood. And one of the prominent problems where we recently, I think, made quite some progress at RIC is to figure out, for instance, where the spin comes from. And it turns out that quite a fraction, it seems, indeed comes also from the clue. So in other words, the low and uh, long distance QCD or the QCD vacuum structure uh, is uh, rather rich. So how, if you have something interesting, how do you want to study it? Well, you heat it up, you compress it. That's what the kids do usually, right? They get a new toy, what do they do? They squeak on it, well, they step on it, and if, if you let them play with fire, they also put it on fire and see what's going on, right? And so here's our QCD vacuum, and what you can do, you can heat it up. By heating it up, you put in more and more mesons, and the system gets denser and denser, and the naive expectation is that at some stage you get so dense that these guys sort of overlap, see these open circles are the anti-quarks, and then you sort of get this soup of quarks which doesn't know where to, where to belong anymore. And you could do, of course, the same thing by squeezing it, and like in a neutron star, 
and all of a sudden these guys overlap and don't know where to belong. Okay? So how do you do this in practice? You need a, a serious oven and I give you an example of them. So this is the RIC accelerator where some of your colleagues work. This is the LHC accelerator where I think there's a CMS group in, in, in the department where some people work. This is a future facility in, in Darmstadt called FAIR. And our theorists, we also nowadays have facilities which are com called super uh, exascale computers, God knows what, right? So this is how you can sort of, there you use lattice QCD methods, and here you actually do real experiments and to probe to compress these nuclei and also heat them up. So then, then you can produce QCD matter, and here is sort of a cartoon how this works. You come in with these heavy nuclei, lead or gold, depending on which continent you live on, and they are Lorentz contractors, so these pancakes come in at high speed, they smash into each other, they generate some hot stuff, high energy, they produce particles, a lot of stuff, they reinteract, and eventually comes out. And what our friends at experimental friends have to deal with is this mess. Right? So this is a sort of an event display from the star uh, 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 detector, and of course if you go to LHC, where you have a factor of three more, roughly a two and a half more particles, the mass is even bigger. Right? So from this mass, you want to learn actually how your system looks like. So when you make this experiment, or you think about this, there are several questions you can ask, and I just listed a few. If you have matter, what the simplest question is, uh, what is the equation of state? What is the pressure as a function of energy density, temperature, and the various conserved quantities? And measurement-wise, you will, and well, we'll talk about this, you measure sort of how fa fast this stuff blows apart. The part if the pressure is high, blows apart faster, and so on. These are so-called flow measurements. And the good thing is that stuff you can actually calculate with lattice QCD method. So in principle, you can calculate this from first principles using QCD. The next, what? What is infinite? Oh, sure, I'm a theorist. Yeah, 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 you're right. It's always, yes. Okay. And next question, once you know the equation of state, is so what are the transport properties? So, so essentially, what are the first variations? If I go a little bit out of equilibrium, how fast does it relax into equilibrium? And here is a typical example, which I use a lot. This is an expression for the shear viscosity. So you, so you have to calculate on the theoretical side some correlation function. And again, as we will discuss a little bit, flow measurements compared with hydrodynamic calculations and jet spectra will hopefully tell you something about this. The problem here is this is a time, so-called time-like observable and cannot be re readily accessed via lattice QCD methods. And therefore, we are a little bit on our own when it comes to the theory. So you cannot really get a, a, a first principle calculation yet. Then, of course, a, a typical question is, so what are re relevant degrees of freedom? Is it really quarks and gluons, or is it dressed quarks, or is it dye quarks, or God knows what could be in this suit, right? And for that, you look at fluctuations, correlations. You might uh, probe photons and dileptons. I will not talk about photons and dileptons because this would be bringing coals to Newcastle since Ralf is one of the world experts on this. And fluctuations and, and correlations, this to some extent, and I will give you an example, you can again address by lattice QCD methods by essentially looking at cumulants of your partition function. This is for I is for, for various for, uh, conserved quantities, charge, strangeness, barrier number, whatever your conserved quantity. Okay. And then, of course, another thing is you want to shine the, uh, 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 an X-ray on it and see is that opaque? Can I shine the light through? Can I look through this? Since it's very hard to shine the laser on X-ray on a heavy ion collision, which lifts uh, whatever 10 to the minus 22 seconds. The way to do this is you produce, you look at a, a very fast particles which are produced in there and see whether they come out uh, unchanged or not. And I will talk about this as well. So this is called uh, Harton, Harton propagation and so on. So just to flash you what one can do, a, a few examples of what one can do on these big computers. So this is sort of the latest about the equation of state as a function of temperature, energy density divided by the temperature to the fourth power. 
And you see here you have fat joints and then over a region of here, this is the insert of, of the relevant region where it changes. Over a region of about 50 to 100 MeV, this thing increases and there you have then more degrees of freedom. And so this is sort of what the equation of state looks like. But you also can study carefully whether this is, which you see here of course now, but whether this is now a real phase transition or it's first order, second order, or whether it's a crossover and the jury is, that's done, this is clearly an analytic crossover. So you don't have a true phase transition at zero uh, ten baryon density, but you have an analytic crossover. You can see how the vacuum structure changes. One measure is the, co the quark condensate, and you see this drops rather uh, uh, rapidly, also around the same temperature. These are actually old lattice data. Now the, this move has moved down by 50 MeV. And you can also measure, for instance, the how much energy does it cost me to pull a, uh, to pull a, a, a baryon out of, out of this soup or a quark out of this soup? And these are these quark number susceptibilities. And you see they also settle. And this is sort of the limit of free quarks. They go up rapidly, but they don't really go to the limit of free quarks just yet. Okay, so this is typically what we get. And, of course, the real relevant question, I mean, you can calculate as much as you want. Of course, you really want to know what nature says, so you do all these experiments. And one of the first questions which people ask is, so I smash these guys into each other, how many charged particles, how many particles come out of you? And one would have thought, since I'm now, if I have now all these internal degrees of freedom, quarks and gluons, which rescatter and so on among each other, I should get much more out than if I just take a proton-proton collision and, and, and multiply by the number of protons in my system. And this was the initial predictions here, which except, expected this, and this is the whole uh, range of prediction prior to RIC, and what, up to RIC, what we saw, it's just, if you have twice as many protons, you just get twice as many particles. So that was sort of a bump. Right? But luckily, just a few years back, LHC turned on, and finally, our expectations are fulfilled. So if you go to sufficiently high energy, you go away from this simple proton scaling, and whoop, you see these nonlinearities. So finally, you see actually the fact that stuff from proton A talks to stuff from proton B and, and proton C. So the multiplicities don't actually scale linear within the proton number. So this is actually great. Another thing which is used a lot for the systematics, that's what I bring, uh, bring it up here. So what you can do, you measure all the number of pions, kaons, protons, God knows what. And then you, surprisingly, well, actually not so much because Fermi argued about this already in 1950, you fit them all with a Boltzmann or bose einstein and Fermi distribution. And you have two fit parameters, which is the barrier number chemical potential and three uh, strangers chemical potential and the temperature. And you see if you can fit this. The fits are absolutely excellent, and then you get, here is the quality of the fit, and then you get sort of numbers for the freeze the temperature and the chemical potential. Then the chemistry stops, so no more chemistry anymore. Right? And you can do this over several bombarding energies, and so you get a rough idea where these systems sort of land. Right? So you make the system somewhere up here, it goes down, and that's where the chemistry stops. So as you lower the beam energy, you go down and down, the temperature gets lower, and the baryon density gets higher, right? So this is sort of the systematics over many, many uh, years of experiments, right? And also interesting, if you go to the LHC, the point is not here, it's right on top of the rig point. So nothing changes, right? This is just what it is. Okay. The next thing you could do is, as I said, I mean, you want to measure the, the, the transparency. So what you look at, you... you, you uh, you look at very high energetic particles or jets which are produced by perturbative QCD because it's a very high Q squared where the interaction is weak, as I showed you. And therefore, you, you can calculate actually this production rate. And then you see, well, is that actually the production rate I expect? Or am I, as these guys go out, are they being absorbed or redistributed, right? And so what you do, you plot a ratio RAA, you measure the PT spectrum AA at in AA, divided by the PP spectrum appropriately scaled for the number of collisions. And if nothing happens, this should be one on the way out. And indeed, the purple plots here, this is a rather old thing, this is photons. 
photons don't get reabsorbed, they just go out, the interaction is too weak, and this is one. But the moment you look at pi ions, pi zeros, and so on, you get a factor of two suppression, or five suppression, and this was one of the featured plots uh, from the early Rick discoveries. What you could also do, you could look at the, at the two-particle correlation, and if you look at the correlation back-to-back -back in deuteron, in proton-proton, you see a back-to-back -back correlation. In gold-gold, it's gone because the backward particle has got fully absorbed. So one particle comes out from the surface, the other one has to go all the way through, so it's gone. So this is essentially the energy loss of leading particles. But of course, one would like to do this for real jets, where one really knows the partons coming out. This is exceedingly difficult at Rick, but comparatively simple, I say. I mean, I, don't, I, mean it's, I know it's hard enough, but even I could see a jet here on this event displays at the LHC. So this is from the CMS event displays in PP. You see here two jets nicely balanced, same energy. And in AA, you see uh, one jet coming out. This comes from the surface, the backwards jet getting absorbed or slowed down in the medium, so you see this total asymmetry. And you can systematize this. One way, again, is to plot this RAA, and this is now for two jets. For RAA, this is one, this would be no physics, or no, no uh, slowing down, and here we are down by a factor of two. Right? And again, for photons, no effect. So indeed, the partons get slowed down, so this stuff which we produce is opaque for partons. Now you may ask, I mean, I wasn't surprised personally when the first jet quenching results came out because even if you have the fastest Ferrari, the moment you are stuck in this traffic, you are just as fast as everybody else, right? So the fact that something, if it goes through a lot of material, gets slowed down, is not so qualitatively surprising. What's surprising actually is the first of all the magnitude that is so large, and second of all, and I don't have time to go into this, CMS has actually shown that the energy which is lost is distributed over rather large angles. So it's not just forward cone a little bit to the side, it's actually distributed almost over all angles. So this is something which still needs to be understood. Here is the real big surprise, which everybody who at least was long enough in this field thought would never happen. And this is called the elliptic flow. And what you see here, so suppose you make an off-center collision of two of these heavy nuclei then the stuff which doesn't talk to each other just flies up and down the beam pipe, and what's left in the middle is some kind of football-shaped hot material. And here I have a 2D, a 2D uh, projection of this. This is your hot material in the green. It's the hot material in coordinate space. And if hydrodynamics is at work, the pressure gradient in, in this direction, because this is shorter, is larger than in this direction. Everybody who built a bomb or knows about bombs, when you want to blow up a, a, a landmine, they're always flat because then it goes in one direction. As a result, this distribution will accelerate stuff more in, in the in-plane or in the x-direction and less in the, and therefore, a shape like this in coordinate space transforms in a shape like this in momentum. And that's you can measure. And what I show you here, this is a time evolution, but of course, this is not a time evolution from a heavy ion collision, but this is a time evolution where one uses one of these cold Fermi gases close to the uh, uh, unitarity limit where I have the strongest interaction. You, you trap them in this shape, you let them loose, and lo and behold, exactly that's the shape you get. That's exactly the same. Right? So you have also this hydrodynamic explosion. And so there is a lot of systematics by now. This is now so what I didn't say. I should go into this, sorry. And the way you characterize this, you, you look at your angular, dis angular distribution, azimuthal distribution, and you make sort of the Fourier components of this. And this V2 is the second Fourier component, which gives you exactly this elliptic shape. Right? And then later on, on, on two slides, I will show you there's even higher components coming up. And so this, this V2 has been measured over many, for many energies, and here you see the systematics. It's as you go up, it go, increases, increases. But if you look at this differentially, PT slice by PT slice, you see here essentially three curves. One is top and uh, is LHC, 2.6 GV. One is 200 GV, 62 GV, 39 GV. It's all the same. So is that bad or good? I think it's good because remember when what we said, we, we have this hadronic phase, then we go through a region of phase transition, and then we go to a new phase of platonic phase. If we make this hotter and hotter, Nothing should change, right? So, it's, so what we do at the LHC is just making hotter steam, but steam nonetheless. So in a sense, this is good. Hopefully, 
if we go even lower, this changes. Right? So, the next thing, and this is the latest, which was, I forgot to put the reference, Gunter Roland and from MIT and, and his student discovered, or figured this out first. People realize that a nucleus is actually made out of nucleons. What this means is when you have this guy hitting each other, so this, uh, the yellow stuff goes in the board, the orange stuff goes out of the board, and this is what overlaps because you have a finite uh, uh, amount of nucleons. This shape, although on the average is an ellipse, as you see by this dashed line, in a given event, it can be a triangle and all kinds of different shapes because of the finite numbers. And therefore, your fireball in a given event is a superposition of an elliptic shape, triangular, da, 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 and so on. And each pressure gradient pushes this in a different direction. And therefore, you would expect that if you do the event-by-event -event analysis, you should get not only second moments, but third, fourth, fifth, sixth moments. And this is, I think, Atlas. And this is beautiful data, uh, which measured this now at the LHC. And similar results have also come out from Rick. So we see all these higher moments as well. And this, of course, puts a much stronger constraint on the theory, right? Because not only do we have to get the second moment right, but we have to get, well, how far are we now? Six moments right. And lo and behold, I couldn't believe it myself, but that stuff seems to come out right. So this is sort of up to five here. This is by Björn Schenke and, and the McGill group. And so they calculate this, and lo and behold, they are bang on the data. So there are two ingredients to this. One is the shear viscosity, which I will be talking about. So how much friction is there? And the other one is how big are these nucleons really? Are they smaller? Are they bigger? So how big are these lumps? And, and so, but by having so many things, one, can, one could imagine that one uh, can constrain these both parameters pretty well. And what he says here, here the shear viscosity for this fit is of the order eta over s, and I will come to this. This is a famous expression, is this eta over s ratio is smaller than 0.5. So I would say what the, all these things mean, all these uh, 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 comparison mean that this shear viscosity over entropy density ratio is smaller than 0.25. Okay? So therefore, I would conclude from this viscous hydro works. And as a result, actually prior to these calculations, people announced that there is RIC or heavy ion collisions creating the perfect Okay, now having grown up in an area where people grow not perfect, but I think reasonable liquids, I had some doubts, right? So if somebody tells me, in, in particular, the Brookhaven PR department gave everybody a coffee mug with a perfect liquid. I always thought if you have a perfect liquid, you have a nice glass. But anyway, so my question was, what is a perfect liquid? I mean, I always thought bottles of this shape are more in the realm of perfect liquids than something like that, right? So let's ask ourselves how we can compare a nice burgundy wine with quark gluon plasma, right? And the, the question is already clear. I mean, the, the burgundy wine is a different length scale than the quark gluon plasma. So before we do this, what goes in there, this is this eta over s, so the shear viscosity over entropy density. Entropy, we have an idea. Just want to remind everybody what the shear viscosity is. So the shear viscosity, if you have two glass plates and a liquid in between, and you, sh you have a, this shear motion, then you, it gives you the amount of, of, of force you need to shear, to move these uh, away from each other. Right? So you have here, this, this is one plate, this is the other plate. This moves with a velocity with respect to this, and of obviously, the, 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 the fluid velocities have a gradient here down there. They get large here and smaller here because this has to be addressed and this has to move with it. Right? And you can quantify this by the shear tensor and the coefficient in front, which gives you the strength of the force, is this eta, which is the shear viscosity. If you think about this in terms of kinetic theory or microscopic theory, gas particles, you can understand how this goes. You have one layer which moves with one velocity, the other layer which moves with a somewhat slower velocity. So by and large, this particle has this velocity, but if this particle now goes over there, then it will, of course, slow down, uh, accelerate this because it takes this velocity over to this velocity, right? But there, therefore, you realize if the, sh the mean free pass of these particles is very short, it cannot travel very far. So it, cannot, it can only sort of transform its longitudinal information about the longitudinal motion only a certain distance. 
And therefore, the shorter the mean free path, the smaller the shear viscosity, the better it shears. So this is somehow counterintuitive. Right? So the stronger the thing interacts, the so shorter the mean free path, the better these things slide away from each other. Right? This is somewhat counterintuitive. Right? OK. But viscosity alone is not the whole story, because if one just looks at the Navier-Stokes equation, which I now translated into simple Newton mechanics, you have a inertia, the mass density, this is a non-relativistic Navier-Stokes equation. Here you have an acceleration term, here you have the force, and here you have the friction. Right? And if you want to know how things get slowed down, it's not enough to know the friction, you better know the mass as well, which I, as I try to illustrate by the comparison of these two vehicles, they might have the same air resistance, but once this guy gets moving, you can't slow this guy down because it weighs like five tons, and this is just whatever, 600 kilograms, right? So what's the more relevant thing of whether things get stuck or not, and this you can look up in Landau, of course, is what is called commonly the kinematic viscosity, which is actually the, sh the ratio of the shear viscosity over the density. And I'll just give you an example. In water, the shear viscosity is actually much larger than in air, although we all believe that actually water is a much nicer fluid than air. The reason why this is true is once you divide by the mass density, which is large in water and small in air, you get exactly what you expect. Right? So for the fluidity, when you pour something, actually the kinematic viscosity is relevant, and not the shear viscosity by itself. OK, so where did this eta over s start? Like many things, which might at the end be interesting, but maybe not so whatever. In, in, in string theory, so people who, who studied uh, what is called the ADS-CFD correspondence, this is a fancy word for even more fancy mathematics, but what it means at the end, there are certain classes of uh, field theories which you can actually solve in the strong, not in the perturbative, but in the strongly coupled limit by transforming or mapping this onto a string theory in a very strange geometry, you calculate, and there the, the interactions are perturbative, so you calculate a perturbative problem in the gravity and do the map and you get results for the infinitely large coupling in the, or large coupling in the gauge theory, right? So this is, I mean, this is not, not yet for QCD, but certain super, supersymmetric theories you can do this. And of course, it's an interesting playground to see general, uh, qualitatively what happens. And what these guys here, Son, Kofton and so on, what they figured out is that in, in a large class of these uh, couple, uh, strongly coupled gauge theories, there's always an upper bound, a lower bound for this ratio of shear viscosity over entropy density. And that's where this ratio came in. Because the entropy density just comes because you deal with black holes in these things, it's just the surface essentially of the black hole. So that's where this comes from, and there's this limit one over four pi. Now, before the string theory guys, actually Danielovich and, and Miklos Kulashi, in 1985, already thought about this in terms of kinetic theory. You have the expression for the shear viscosity in terms of kinetic theory, where you have the density, the thermal velocity, the mass of the particles, and the, uh, the mean free path. And then you can sort of wave your hands a little bit, and this is tricky because now you do quantum arguments for kinetic theory, where actually quantum mechanics should not be relevant anymore. So this is sort of what is in the loose area. One says, well, Velocity times mass, this is sort of a momentum, and this is the length, so the momentum times length by uncertainty principle should be larger than h bar. The density is roughly the, 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 uh, the, 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 the entropy density, and therefore this, literally this ratio eta over density, this is not the mass density, this is the number density, uh, the, or roughly eta over s should be sort of bound. And here you come up with one, whether it's one or one over four pi. So this is the argument that there might be bound due to quantum mechanics. So for the practice of, of these heavy ion collisions or for my bottle of uh, burgundy, the first question, of course, is does the quantum bound, if it happens, actually provide a limit on the fluidity, namely on the way how well hydrodynamics works or how well I can pour my, 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 my water in, in a glass? And then the real question is how about other substances? Water? Pinot Noir, which is usually a good proxy for burgundy wine, but light, which is a good proxy for water, <laughs> liquid helium, cold quantum gases, and even interstellar gas. People who do uh, astrophysics and star formation, 
they use hydrodynamic to a very good approximation for interstellar gases. How, one does, how does one define fluidity such that I can compare an interstellar gas with water with a gore gluon plasma? Where's the different Planck scales? And I note, here's the Navier-Stokes equation, and I don't see, I see eta, but I don't see s. So how does eta over s play a role in this Navier-Stokes equation? Certainly uh, uh, is perfectly good for water and interstellar gas. So somehow something is not perfectly good. So, I already said these are my very big varieties, and here I give you sort of the different length scales. Interstellar dust has an interparticle distance of 10 to the minus 4 meters, water 10 to the minus 10, air 10 to the minus 9, quark gluon plasma 10 to the minus 15. And if I talk about a perfect liquid, I mean that my astrophysics friend says, well, I have the per more perfect liquid uh, or fluid, we have to have a way to map, to match, to compare, right? Typically, what's done in fluid dynamics is the Knudsen number. You calculate the mean free pass from kinetic theory or elsewhere, and you, you compare the mean free pass of the system to the length scale of the variation. Suppose you have a sound wave, you have the sound wavelength. If this is large compared to the uh, mean free pass of the system, hydrodynamics is just perfect. Hydrodynamics is essentially the effective theory for a long wavelength phenomenon. There it's perfect. However, this is sort of something which I give from the outside. I cannot, I mean, I, I cannot say, well, I, yes, a, a, a interstellar dust at 100 gigaparsec is better than the quark gluon plasma at one Fermi. So I, this is not actually something part of the substance itself. So I need to, I need to sort of replace this by something which is in, in, uh, typical to the fluid, right? And so that's what we do. So, Let's define fluidity. First of all, step one, define, we, we will extract an effective mean free pass solely from fluid dynamics and measurements like shear viscosity and so on, which are not uh, require any kinetic uh, theory approximation. And then we calibrate this not with the length of the, of the, pro of the probe, but with an, in with an intrinsic length, like, let's say, like the interparticle distance. And in order to get this effective mean free pass, I analyze sound modes. And sound modes are, as I just said, right? This is now the, the dispersion relation for sound modes. Omega equals the speed of sound times the, the wave number. And the, and the damping comes in with wave number squared. That's exactly what I said. The longer the wavelengths, the, 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 the better hydrodynamics works, and the damping goes away, because it goes like 1 over the wavelength squared. And down here, so here we have the shear viscosity. Down here, now this, if you use the relativistic... Uh, 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 hydrodynamics, you get here something which is called the enthalpy, energy plus pressure, which is this expression. This is t uh, temperature times entropy density times mass times number density. In the non-relativistic limit, the mass density, of course, wins. And in the relativistic limit, the entity S wins, right? And there you can already see when you're in the relativistic limit, you get eta over S. This is fine. That's exactly what we talked about. But the moment I talk about water, the S has nothing to do out there. It's eta over rho. This is what, we just, what I just showed you from uh, Landau's book, where you have the kinematic discovery. Right? So this cannot, as far as this is concerned, not be a universal equality measure. It might be an interesting measure for other considerations, but certainly not for fluidity. OK, and so you go through. You have your real imaginary part of this uh, 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 frequency, a real part. You say this should be smaller than one so that you have a good wave, which actually doesn't get damped right away. And then, of course, this depends on the wavelength. The longer the wavelength, the, the smaller is the, the, the damping. And so then I get sort of in this length scale, this is just here, eta over the en uh, uh, enthalpy times the sound velocity. And so this lambda gives me sort of a minimum wavelengths below, if I make the wavelengths shorter, it gets, just gets them the way right away. So it goes, boom, it's gone, right? So I get a minimum wavelengths. And so this then, of course, <coughs> uh, and then what I, get, what I, what I again, then can find is if I now plug in the kinetic theory expressions for this uh, 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 attenuation length L eta, this is exactly the, 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 up to the, all the constants, exactly the mean free pass, right? And now all I have to do, I divide, cal calibrate by the interparting distance. This is n to the one-third. And here I have my fluidity measure, which is eta over WCS divided by the interparting distance. And this depends only on intrinsic properties of the substance, the density, the shear viscosity, 
the enthalpy and the speed of sound. So this doesn't require any approximations whatsoever. Okay, and then you go open, go to the web where all, all these data are, and what you find is that this actually works remarkably well. So here I plotted this, this fluidity measure as a function of T over Tc for various substances taken at the critical pressure. And the substances are listed here. And they all seem to fall on the same curve. You might argue that the somewhat more complex substances uh, are deviating a little bit. So this is the value at, at the minimum here, right? And it would be interesting, and I still haven't figured this out, what uh, uh, mineral oil, motor oil would do. It's probably sitting up there. But by and large, what do you learn from this, whether it's water, helium, and, 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 and so on, neon, and so on, a good fluid is a good fluid, period. Right? OK. So now that we have a measure, the question is, who is the winner? Actually, none of the above, unfortunately. Because there is something which we realize by looking at all these chemistry uh, data tables, which is called a supercritical fluid. And so what I, what I have listed for you, this is now, let me see if I get this right. So this is water at the critical pressure, right? This is helium at the critical pressure for this fluidity measure. And this is sort of a, an idea of this phenomenological fit, what we think comes out of these heavy ion collisions. These are these cold Fermi atoms where here the inner particle distance is a little bit tricky and also at that time the measurement of the shear viscosity was not perfect. This is this string series and this is water at 45 times the critical pressure. So this flows best. And actually a critical, a supercritical fluid and there's a whole literature about this are fluids which have a temperature and a pressure above the critical temperature. It's in, the, in this box here. And here I show you this for water, the fluidity as you go. This is critical, and here you're in the super, it goes flatter and flatter. And also interesting, it's flat. It's rather flat. There's very little energy, uh, temperature dependence. In there, right? And this has actually some implications or applications. It's used in decaffeinating coffee, at least the, the more fancy decaffeinated coffees, which are not using this whatever cleaning fluid. And it's used in fancy dry cleaning with liquid CO2, supercritical CO2. And obviously, therefore, the winner is the supercritical fluid, right? Okay. Next. So everybody says that borglum plasma actually has a small shear viscosity, quite to the contrary. After spending half a day in, 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 in transforming 1 over 4 pi into real units, this is what I came up with, and I might be an order of magnitude wrong, but that's, that's not, right? This is actually an interesting exercise. So here are, are, are real units, Pascal, seconds, air, water, tar pitch, which got an IG Nobel Prize in 2005, has 10 to the 8, and UGP is even more sticky than tar pitch, right? So it's not a low viscosity. It's actually the largest viscosity we have so far. Right? Just here, it's 10 to the 12 times that of water. So how would I find out about this, right? If it's eta over s, s is large, eta is large, the ratio is small, right? That's why it shows up. The kinematic viscosity is small because eta is large and the mass tensor, in this case Ts, is small and therefore it appears like good fluid. A way to do this is if we could somehow find a way to stir your work gluon plasma. Because if you go to your favorite fluid dynamics book, there is Stokes' formula. The force on an, of a sphere of radius r, which is streamed along or pulled through this, uh, which are way pulled through a, a fluid with a velocity u, is given by this. And there, only eta enters. Not eta over rho or eta over s, but only eta. Right? And now let's compare that, the stickiness, right? Of course, in order to have a fair comparison, I have to rescale the size of my spoon to the size, I mean, the, uh, to the appropriate size, right? I mean, water is, has much bigger length scale than, than the quark gluon plasma. In order to have a fair comparison, the, the, the spoon in the quark gluon plasma has to be appropriately smaller than that for water. Otherwise, I, I don't, don't make a fair comparison. So I do this here, and then I find that the force in the quark gluon plasma is about 10 to the 6 times larger than water. So it's really sticky, right? 
And now I'm getting sort of a little bit speculating. So how do we build it? I mean, wouldn't it be fantastic to have a quark gluon blossom? And I think, I mean, we, I mean, Ralph is also thinking about these things. I think maybe there is a way, if we think about this in the right way. And this has to do, so I have this fluid, which is ma mostly made out of gluons and light quarks. So what about if we think about a heavy quark, a charm quark, or a bottom quark, which doesn't really dissolve in it because of flavor conservation in terms of a small spoon. If this is true, these heavy quarks should be just tracked along like crazy. They should not just move through this. If I have really the sticky stuff, this should be tracked along. And lo and behold, that's actually what the data show. Here you see the RAA for, for D mesons. This is now from the Alice collaboration. And next year, I'm sure we get from Star and Phoenix as a dedicated run at, at RIC to exactly look at this, also at very low PT. And lo and behold, this stuff gets suppressed and actually almost just like the light stuff. Right? So this stuff gets really slowed down like this sticky spoon. And also, the heavy quarks, they get this explosion. So you have this fat guy and you, this type guy, usually you would think you have this, this fluid flowing around. If this would be a, a low viscous fluid, you have this fat guy sitting there and the stuff would flow around this guy who sits there. But what we see, it actually gets blown apart just like the other stuff as well. So this fluid actually tracks these heavy guys a lot. So maybe that's the best we can do about a teaspoon unless Carl comes up with something better. So, is it a perfect fluid? Well, that's up to you what you call perfect. It certainly flows as well or better than water, and it's more sticky than star pitch. If you call this perfect, I don't know, I call it absolutely fascinating, and as far as I'm concerned, it's unique. Why does it flow as good as water? Because it's not only sticky, but it's also heavy. So if you slosh it, it's just like the, the hammer I showed you, right? If you slosh it, it actually, the inertia just moves along. And it's sticky because it's sticky, right? And before I showed you this comparison, this was, uh, the quark gluon blast one, the Fermi blot was up here in the corner, and the, the cold gas was down here. And what they see there is the same phenomenology. They also see this eta over, uh, this, this V2, this, this explosion there, right? And here's the measurement from very, with various things from Thomas et al. on this shear viscosity. And they have actually tabletop experiments. They actually can do probably a much better job on this. And you see, this is this quantum bound. And here you see the kinematic and the kin kinetic uh, region. And as you cool this down, you get somewhere in this region. It's also very, very small eta over S. But there's a huge difference. The ratio in both might be small. And it is. In both cases, I'm, I'm here loose and say they are smaller, much smaller than one. In the quark gluon plasma, eta is huge and S is huge, but the ratio is small. S is just much huger than eta, if you allow me for this abuse of language. Whereas in the cold Fermi gas, eta is small and S is small. Right? And that's just why. So, although the phenomenology is the same, and, they, and therefore, since it's hydrodynamics is the same, it's not clear to which extent we can actually relate this and to figure this out is actually one of the interesting questions we are working on. And the next question, of course, is what is it, our quark gluon plasma? Our string theory guys say this is actually goo. There are no particles, it's just boop, stuff. Whereas a regular liquid is made out of, usually out of water particles on which are correlated and so on and so on. So can we actually address this? And actually there are some interesting data which are already uh, several years old. So you look at this V2 for different particles, pions, kaons, and so on, and here baryons. And if you plot this V2 not as a function of PT, but as a function of kinetic energy, you see that all the mesons line up and all the baryons line up. Right? So this is interesting. And even the phi, the phi meson, although it's as heavy as, the, as a proton, lines up nicely with the meson. So people like Rainer and Cheming have, for, have proposed maybe this comes from a simple effect because I have two quarks, they recombinate, combine, make me a meson. I have three quarks, they recombine and make me a baryon. And if you then divide this V2 by the number of quarks and this by the number of quarks and the formula you can derive yourself here, zoop, everything like that. So this seems to be an indication that we actually have, we have this stuff and before it hydronizes, they just crap it. But my interpretation, of course, of this is if I have goo, I cannot do that. 
that seems to be sort of an experimental hint that maybe we don't have goo, but we have water, quasi particles. Another thing one can uh, one can just test this is an old idea we had, where one looks at baryon number and strangeness correlations because the lattice can calculate this. And the thing is, if you have a free quark or a quark and not a correlated quark, then a quark is not only a strange quark is not only a strange, but it's also a baryon, and strangeness can only be found as a baryon, not as a. If, a, if strangeness is a meson, then it has to be a bound set of QQ bonds. For instance, the hadron gas where if you have correlations, the moment you find strangeness, you don't necessarily find baryon number, you can also find the k on. If you have gluon plus one, the moment you find strangeness, you also find baryon number. Right? So this way, you can test correlations. And let me just... And so you can define something. I'm very proud to have introduced the concept of BS into uh, physical review letters. And so this is the correlation between the baryon number and the strangeness calibrated by the, the, the strangeness squared in order to get factors out, which you can calculate in, 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 in experiment, although it's difficult because you have to measure neutrons. But you, the interesting thing is, and here is just a quick, the way it's designed such, when you have non-interacting quarks, really nice quasi-particles for quarks, this thing is one, that's how we put all the factors in front. And for instance, when you have a hadron gas where you have correlations, then you get this thing different from one smaller one. The nice thing is that actually this can be calculated on the lattice, and it gives you an idea how much space you have in your phase diagram where things are different from quasi particles. And this is now the latest coming from Wuppertal Budapest collaboration, and it, it fully agrees with the Bielefeld Brookhaven collaboration. And so here's the temperature. This is TC. This is one. There is quasi particles only. Here you see the hadrons, and it goes down. 0.6 is roughly what we, what we predicted here, right? And so if you say here it's over, you have about, well, 100 MeV where you could imagine that your quark gluon plasma is something other than quasi particles. It could be goo or maybe correlated stuff. Who knows, right? So I would say the lattice gives you some, but rather little room for possible gooiness above the critical temperature. Right, so how else we can test this? Uh, I don't know. So let me just quickly summarize uh, what we learned from the top uh, uh, RIG LHC experiments. The matter is opaque. It flows like good fluid. Uh, a fluid. It's sticky like tar pitch. Quasi particles or goo. I think the re recombination observa observation of this uh, 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 recombination f f uh, uh, scaling clearly favors quasi particles. And the lattice, lattice actually allows for a little bit of gooiness and no sign of a phase transition at high energies, but that's what expected because we know it's an analytic crossover. So how do we make progress? Well, you just turn the knobs you have. One knob is to change the system size, and the other knob is to change the beam energy. And when you change the beam energy, you want to see how things turn off, and you look for possible phase changes. And this is a talk by itself, and I will just briefly touch it. So people change the system size, and at LHC, they changed it such to make it minimal small, they made a proton nucleus collision. And then it's always a problem, right? I mean, once you have a nice theory, then all these experimentalists do another experiment and mess it all up. So what, we, what they see now, this is this cosine 2 phi behavior, which we attributed to hydrodynamic flow, and now one sees this when you hit a nucleus with a proton. Very small thing. So this is being heavily discussed. Some people think it's still hydrodynamic. Some people think it has to do with complicated fluid dynamics. Certainly, our picture needs to be refined and better understood. So this is actually good because new experiments always make you think harder. Now, about scanning the phase diagram, I'm running out of time, so let me just be brief here. This is an entire program which started about, well, three years ago or so at, at RIC. Where, so you see this thing, we know, uh, this, this, this plot here. We know from the lattice there is no phase uh, 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 transition here. It's a crossover. But many models suggest that there is a first order phase transition here ending in a critical point. So and by lowering the beam energy, one could sort of see if one cannot see effects from this phase transition. And this sort of these freeze out curves tell you how far you have to go out. So these are the first from this beam energy scale. And 
And of course, while you do this, now you have all these great observables of the quark gluon plasma. You turn, uh, you turn the, the heat down, you lower the energy. These observables should sort of change. Otherwise, you would have fooled yourself. Right? Now, the problem is they haven't changed so much. So, for instance, this flow, this is the flow at 64, 39, 27, 19, 11, and here we're running out of statistics. But so far, if you, I mean, the phi measurement might be different, but this is certainly needs to be improved. Remember, I showed you at the beginning where 64 and 39 was the same as LHC, top energies, and there is not much of a change yet. So we have to really be careful, right? What is seen is there is a difference between flow of particles and antiparticles, but as my postdoc, Jan Steinheimer, showed, this you can actually understand by just in taking into account if you go to lower energies, you actually stop the matter, so you have actually finite baryon density which splits particles and antiparticles. What's more interesting is now this, this, this jet quenching or this opaqueness. The opaqueness, if you go here 39, 27, and then it slowly gets transparent. Right? So the question is, is, are these data good enough? Do we have to go further out? But there seems to be something that may be below 25, 20 GB, maybe something happens. So who knows, right? So there is still work to do. We need certainly much better data, right? Energy loss seems to disappear here. Maybe there is something, if you plot it on top of each other, this seven likes to go away from the other ones. And so we need better statistics. So maybe we can actually find the point where this quark gluon plasma actually disappears. Exploring the phase diagram, you, there, these are the speculations here, and I plot this as versus temperature versus the density. Here is a critical point. This is the coexistence region. Inside, you have an unstable region, which gives my mechanical instabilities and so on. The critical point is every, a lot of people like, like to discuss this. I only note it's very hard to find a point, and so maybe one should concentrate on this area and then extrapolate to find the point. And there's a big program looking at long-range fluctuations and so on. And I just want to show, well, actually, I, I, I probably skipped this. And so if one searches for this phase structure, what you want to do clearly is you want to scan the beam energy because suppose you, you, these are the different beam energies you go through, and all of a sudden you, you go through this phase transition, so you should, should see some, something, uh, your observer, something changes, right? What people, for instance, look at are very much discussed the accumulants of the barrier number or rather the proton number because one cannot measure the barrier number, accumulants of the charge. These are difficult experiments and one has to understand the detector very well, so they are, I didn't want to show results because they are still sort of in the developing stage. That's why I call this very tricky. One could look at these higher moments, how the clumpiness change, and here I just show from a real calculation which uh, actually does simulate this first order phase transition, and these are density moments as a function of energy. Indeed, you see a huge enhancement of these density moments if you go through this uh, 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 unstable region, and so this is something one should be looking at. So this is the seventh moment, the fifth moment, so there, in the theory, there's a huge effect. How to pull this out of the data is yet another story. Right? So, let me summarize. About the quark gluon plasma, I think it's a fascinating substance. I never thought it felt like that because initially we just thought, well, it's a plasma, a few non weakly -weak -weak interacting uh, 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 quarks and gluons. Quite to the contrary, has a huge viscosity, flows like water, sticky like tar pitch, as I said. The open question, I think, is still, I mean, I, I don't think we haven't answered this yet, whether it's goo or quasi particles. I would put my money on the quasi particles, but I lost money before, so. It's certainly very opaque matter. I mean, now with the, where, where we have these jets at the LHC, there's just no question about it. That I mean, one case, uh, or they do even for nowadays some photon jets, although they're not that as nice, but it's clearly that this stuff gets slowed down. And what's also not yet understood, because all the theories, they sort of have this low angle scattering to de deposit energy, that it seems that this energy is actually dis distributed at rather large angles. At the top energies, there is no indication of a phase transition, as expected, because that we, we, we don't think that is why it's just a smooth crossover. Another puzzle which sort of got thrown in the way is this uh, uh, proton-lead collisions show flow-like. I have this in 
patterns, whether this is flow or whatever, we have to figure out. And another thing which disturbs me, that's why we need the better data at the very low energies, the flow essentially seems to be the same all the way down to whatever, 19 GV, from 2.5 TV all the way down to 19 GV. So maybe the phase transition is really even further down. We have to see. Right? But I want to really know. And the phase diagram beam energies can, of course, go after this. I just said, uh, so, uh, so again, the flow is the same, but the energy loss is not. In order to go after the, the, the phase diagram, the strategy is to just can the beam energy and look for some bumps in the road. There are now real hydrodynamic calculations of these spinodal instabilities, blob formation. It's seen in the hydro, but we haven't yet figured out. I mean, we tried three different observables, and once you really calculate them, they don't work, so we have to work harder. And I should note, at lower energies where you have a nuclear, so a, a nucleons going to a gas of nucleons to a liquid of nucleons, they are actually these spinodal uh, instabilities were actually extremely helpful to identify this. So, thank you. Right, right. Yes. Right. 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 No, you're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. So at the moment we have we have a very small aperture spectrometer on this problem, right? I mean, we have, in a sense, right? Uh, I'm not really aware of it, but what I can tell you is, I mean, if I just take the electromagnetic part of it, right, you would then think that photon radiation or the lepton radiation, which is virtual photon, should sort of show something. Right? Well, ask the expert, right? I mean, you just do your standard hydrodynamic evolution and, and put in the standard rates without any fancy plasma physics, and it works by and large extremely well. There's one phenomenon which is that they also see in this photons, this elliptic asymmetry, which Ralph thinks he can explain it, other people don't, whereas there's some, as one nowadays calls, tension. But maybe the stuff is, but maybe we are not looking at the right thing, right? I mean, it feels like you're on the first, the first layer. Yes? Yes, exactly. Yes? Yes, yes. Yeah, look, I mean, I, my hobby is actually working at correlations, right? But this, this is a hobby, and it's actually frustrating and fluctuations, right? Where you should go, go at least to the two-particle level, right? And then these guys measure it, and it's all statistics. So maybe it's just not that either we are looking in the wrong direction, or we, we are so swamped with other boring stuff, no, I, I, I see I see your point, right? But I mean, as as far as, but the experts in the room, I, Jimmy. Yeah, but it's essentially t a T rho, right? I mean, so you have a density, right? I mean, right? 
Yes. Yes. Yes, yes. Yes. I mean, but we, in the data you don't see anything of this, right? Right. In the data, there is nothing seen like that. Right. Right. Yes, thanks. Okay, so, good question, right? The viscosity, uh, the viscosity will probably likely grow. But the viscosity over entropy ratio, that's probably what you're asking for. Viscosity of an entropy ratio, so we put out a bet that it would go down by making this analogy with the, <coughs> what you call this, the supercritical fluids, right? If they are, the further you go away from, the, actually, the, 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 the better the, the, the fluidity gets, right? Now, the jury is still out. I mean, the present calculations give, what is it, 0.15 best fit for, for a rig and 0.2. So it, the present calculations say, the A over S going from RIC to LHC goes slightly up, right? Theor theoretically, I mean, you can argue either way, right? I mean, if the, the, the coupling constant we know in QCD drops, but it drops only logarithmically, whereas the densities go like the third power of the temperature. So it's not, it's not clear whether it's really a fact of the coupling constant or if it's a more many-body physics, right? If it's more many-body physics, then, of course, Right, so it's not clear which way it goes. I mean, so the typical prediction by people, but nobody actually can calculate this, right? I mean, you can calculate this perturbatively and the edge would go down. But eta over s? Oh, really? Is that right? I have to check. Oh, no, no, you're right, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, up. Yeah, that's what I meant, up, yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's right. So there is a lattice calculation which calculated the equation of state, pressure, right? And at, what was it, 10 to the 5 times Tc, it gets perturbed. It's, I, I mean, this is because the coupling goes actually logarithmically. You have to go extremely far out before you really reach the asymptotic limit, which you would think. So it's more complicated than that. Yeah, right, right. Since you have... Yes. Yeah. This is a. Uh, this is. I mean, they don't trigger too much on high. I mean, at, in order to get this, I mean, it is some high, it, but it's not the extreme window of the of the of the high multiplicity. As I said here, I didn't mention this. You see a similar but not as nice effects even in PP if you trigger on the very high. Exactly right. So the multiplicity here, I think, if I remember, is of the order of hundreds or so. I think this is, I mean, we, we still need a few more months to digest this stuff. This is sort of a... Yeah, 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 yeah. And I mean, actually, I should, I should be actually give proper credit. The first guys to do this was CMS. I used only Alice because they had the nicest plot for this purpose here. But, so, I mean, it took me for a long time to believe that even a small nucleus should behave like hydrodynamics. Now I sort of swallowed that. Now they come and drill a little hole in the nucleus and tell me it's hydrodynamics. I mean, at some stage. <laughs> Thank you.
This is actually impressive here. 